Well, good afternoon if you are in Boston or New York or places in the northern and southern hemispheres of the Americas that are in this time zone. Good evening if you're in Oxford or Berlin or Bayreuth or Milan. Special hello and love to our dear ones in Ukraine. We are with you. We love you. Good morning to people in places like Beijing and Singapore and Melbourne, Australia. My name is Fred Plotkin. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to music lovers around the world. My guest today is someone I've never met, we've never spoken with, but I'm a big admirer of her work. It is Cerise Jacobs, and she joins me from Boston. Welcome, Cerise. Hello, Fred, and hello, everybody who's listening. She, as you can see from the graphic, is the founder, maybe co-founder, of the White Snakes Projects. And we're going to get into what is the White Snake Projects. But I, I want to start a bit with a biography of you. I know you were born in Singapore to what you describe as a traditional Chinese family. We'll find out what that is. Singapore being a very diverse, small but very diverse community with its own rules and its own way of approaching life and, and life decisions. You moved to Australia when you were 16. You dropped out of school at 19. You left Melbourne. You wound up in Oxford in England later in East Lansing, Michigan, Vancouver, Canada, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then Boston. You spent 20 years practicing law, much of it as a trial partner, specializing in criminal defense and patent litigation, for five years as a federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, and that is part of your commitment to public service. All of that before founding White Snakes Project, White Snake Projects. The first thing I want to ask you is we ask our guests to give music recordings that one can find on the Idacho catalog that are particularly inspiring to you. And one of them you gave is the Decca recording of Wagner's Die Valkyra with Birgit Nielsen and a wonderful cast. And the question I have for you regarding that is not why, because it's a fantastic recording of a fantastic opera, but given your background in law and given that central to De Valkyra is the issue of, are we supposed to abide by the laws, whatever they are, which is Fricka's belief that basically ah. this is the law and that's it. Um, there inscribed on Wotan's staff that he carries? Or do we take Brunhilde's point of view that if the law is not good, we don't respect the law, we do the right thing, or at least what we perceive to be the right thing. It is a central issue in all of our lives every day, all the time. Um, if we don't like a law, do we ignore it? Do we tr try to change the law? or do we just do what we believe to be right? Fred, this first question is a doozy. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I'm not shy. <laughs> this, <laughs> it's a huge philosophical question, which I myself, of course, struggle with because you know, given, it's so interesting hearing you um, walk me through um, my, wow. my history. And um, what I will say is growing up in Singapore, we, my answer, if I hadn't lived in the United States for so long, my answer would be, I'm totally on Fricka's side, right? Because um, Singapore is what we call, <laughs> what I call benign totalitarian, now I won't be able to pronounce this word. Totalitarian? Totalitarianism, yes, yes. And thank you. And so of course we all obey the law without questioning it. 
none at all because you're raised in a society that is very, very rule oriented. And when I came to America, I think uh, the biggest shock to my system was the independent thinking that Americans have. And yes, that can result in a lot of chaos and dissension. And in fact, now, you know, deep rifts in our society. I say our because I'm now very proud to be an American. And um, and it has, I have severely questioned during my journey, uh, my self journey through America, um, what, what really do laws mean? And of course, we've got the whole idea of social movements being able to change laws. So am I for vigilante justice, which you could in one sense view Brunhilde's act as? The answer is no, but I do believe in the most sort of ethical sense that it is our duty as right thinking human beings, not to blindly follow the law, but to sometimes when appropriate to protest, to question and to use legal means to change the laws. And that's what, you know, I have spent part of my life doing when I was a federal prosecutor, because of course, as a prosecutor, uh, our lawyer is not winning, but it is to see that justice is done. Even so, if that means losing. I understand. So let's add other elements to this question, but we're staying always with <clears throat> the ring with Di Valkyra, with Brunhilde, with Fricka, with Votan. Mm -hmm. there is what I would call the law of nature. And I don't mean the environment for now, although that obtains, but I mean the law of nature that created us as human beings and our inner nature, our imperfections, our ability to look at the same thing. When you and I and a hundred other people look at a painting or go to an opera or hear a symphony, we hear or see the same thing, but we don't receive it and understand it in the same way. And therefore, when in America, very specifically, when Americans talk about their rights, their interpretation of their rights, and I, this applies also to Di Valkyra, of their right to do what they believe to be so, their right to engage in the behavior that they prefer. I mean, in Di Valkyra, we have a brother and a sister who choose to have sex to produce a child to continue their lineage. A lot of people would say they can't do that. Other people would say, well, that's their right as free thinking individuals. Um, I guess what I'm grappling with a lot in our society, and I mean world society, not just the United States, is the sense of what is for the common good, because if each of us acts on our own belief of what we believe is good for ourselves, that's very destructive. And I think we see that played out in Wagner's Ring Cycle. And I think we see this played out in world events. And I think we see this played out in individual relationships between people, whether they are romantically involved, whether they're friends or whether they're adversaries. My God. Fred, another doozy. <laughs> These, I mean, you have touched on some of the most fundamental um, philosophical and ethical issues, which is, again, you know, a, a, a journey that, that I am still in the process of discovering who I am, and this is at the core of that journey, right? Because growing up in Singapore, it was all about the group, you know, and it was all about society and the good of 
the society and the individual is totally subsumed um, it, it, in, into, into the hive, so to speak. And then of course, we, in America, the, this individualism, which also breeds, you know, which is the root of independent thinking, when taken to the extreme, I think, is so destructive. So I think there has to be a balance, a balance between the good of your community versus the good of self. And the right of the community can never be forgotten when one is an individual because you do not live on an island. You know, you live in this community. And if the community's rights are not as important as your rights, then you balance what you want to do, then your community and, and the society you live in is not going to exist for long. And that's how you get these extreme behaviors of violence, of um, not to get into this whole uh, political issue of the right to bear arms versus, you know, the lives of children in school, because I know this is a very hot topic and this is not the place for it, but you get these incredibly violent situations because where do the rights of your fellow citizens come into play against your individual right? That's and the reason that. I'm bringing all this up is not to have a discussion on current affairs, although I'm always available for that. <laughs> but because every single thing that you and I have been talking about in the past 10 minutes or so is in opera. Everything about who we are, about the issues that we discuss in our lives, about the things that we feel, about justice, about the obligation to the group and to a larger society, as opposed to one's individual pursuits, we could have we could find that in Andrea Chenier, we can find that in La Clemenza di Tito, we can find that in Tannhäuser, we can find that in Aida, we can find that in so much of Verdi, actually, and much of Wagner. Um, in earlier operas, such as those by Mozart and Rossini, they may seem more droll, more comedic, and so on. They too touch on the deepest issues of identity and self and group and belonging and so on. And the reason for this is that, the reason I'm bringing this up is that many people say, oh, opera is not for me. Opera is dull, opera is boring, opera is in another language, opera is fat people singing, which is not always true, sometimes it is. Um, but you look at an audience for a rock concert, there are plenty of fat people in the audience. So, I mean, <laughs> Who are they to knock someone, other fat people who are doing good work? Um, but really, because what I've come to understand about the White Snake projects is that it is not, I want to say, just opera for entertainment, but it's opera with a purpose, opera with a connection to a larger whole. And my question about Di Valcura was based, in fact, on the notion that you come from a legal background. That as you mentioned, you came from a society that has a collective sense of laws or you were raised in that society. Um, you then moved to other countries. The reason I mentioned all the places you live is because you've been washed with many of the waters of the world and you have immersed in those waters as well. And you now live in a place, Boston, that is unto itself a very special environment. It's known as the Athens of America. It has incredible academic institutions. It has wonderful cultural resources. It has also, not far away, I, I've lectured a lot in Boston and nearby Fitchburg State University. And it's a part of the world that I really love. And near there is Walden Pond, where Henry David Thoreau lived and wrote. And his work when I was a very young man was profoundly influential to me. 
And only about 10 years ago did I get to visit Walden Pond and understand how a place can influence one's thinking and attitudes. And so tell me about you in Boston. Boston for me, of course, is home now. I've lived in Boston. You know, I arrived after all this sort of sojourning to various parts of the world, arrived in Boston, fittingly, during the bicentennial. 1976. Correct. And um, and I, I went, came to Boston then, and I found Boston to be my first encounter with Boston was, of course, in Cambridge. That's where I lived because I went to Harvard Law School, and so I, I lived there. And it was so, you know, when I grew up in Singapore, it was a British crown colony. So I'm very, very steeped in all things England, for better or for worse, Um, because I grew up as a British colonial subject. And and so, uh, and then I lived in two Commonwealth. I mean, I went back to, I went to England to live in Oxford, and then I lived in Australia, which is, of course, a Commonwealth, British Commonwealth country. And I found that Boston was very, very English in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And so it was actually quite easy for me to, um, to fit right into Boston. I think if I had gone someplace else to the Midwest or to the South, I think it would have been a harder assimilation uh, for me. But I also found um, Boston to be extremely um, how would you say, New Englanders, because of their, their puritanical background, are also quite reserved and, and are quite, um, um, how, they, they, they are not very welcoming, let's put it that way. And it took me a while to, to penetrate that because I'm contrary to stereotype, you know, I'm Chinese, I should be reserved, but I'm actually quite an exuberant um, kind of person. And uh, because, uh, maybe because Singapore is tropical, so we're all mm-hmm. pretty uh, um, exuberant people. And yeah, it took me a while to, to, to get acclimatized personally, even though the society was very much what I understood. Well, just for our listeners to understand around the world, Boston is one of the cradles of the American Revolution. In 1770, I should know this perfectly, but I believe it was 1770, was the famous Boston Tea Party in which the people of Boston dumped ear drinking tea. (laughs) Coffee. (laughs) you see that's why you don't live in boston right (laughs) and the people of boston the british were taxing over taxing the cost of tea and but the people complained that they had taxation without representation in other words legal presence and a say in their own destiny and tea was dumped into the boston harbor and that's what was called the Boston Tea Party. And I, my next question for you actually was, you more of a tea drinker being from Asia originally and having lived in places to drink tea, or are you a coffee drinker? I actually drink both. I drink coffee in the morning and then I switch to tea because there's really only that much coffee one can drink before you become hyper Animated? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to be more animated, Fred, in case you haven't noticed. I do not need to be more animated. That's okay. Well, so you raised an important point about Boston. The city I love, I'm I'm a native New Yorker, and it's often said that New Yorkers and Bostonians have a rivalry. Not really. It's based a bit on our sports teams. Boston teams tend to be better than ours. Um, It goes all the way back to 1923 when 
the best player in baseball, Babe Ruth, played for the Boston Red Sox. And they foolishly, from their point of view, sold him to the New York Yankees, making the New York Yankees the greatest baseball team ever. And they continued to be that after Babe Ruth retired. But it's called the Curse of the Bambino. Bambino was his nickname. And the Curse of the Bambino worked in reverse because... When the Tanglewood Festival, one of the world's great music festivals, was being created in Western Massachusetts, they first invited the New York Philharmonic to be the resident orchestra, and they stupidly said no. So then they turned to the Boston Symphony, which is a fantastic organization, and so that's why the Boston Symphony is the official orchestra of Tanglewood, much the way the Vienna Philharmonic is the official orchestra of the Salzburg Festival. And so the curse of the Bambino worked in reverse on, on that musical thing. But another thing to point out about New York, let's say, as opposed to Boston, and this is something people don't know about New York. New York was not founded by the British. New York was founded by the Dutch. Obviously, the Lenape peoples, the native peoples, the indigenous peoples lived here before. But when it was created as a city, it was New Amsterdam. And our core values in New York really came from the Dutch, whereas the core values in Boston came from the British. So wow. that when people compare the cities, they don't necessarily recognize that. That's in part why we New Yorkers drink more coffee than tea and why Bostonians historically drank more tea. The, all these details in our society and, and about peoples that are not seen, but nonetheless are fundamental to how cities run. I, I think that every single culture, and that's not just national culture, but local culture, breathes the language, the gesture, the physicality, the geography, the weather of the place that they are in. And that's why you can be 250 miles, about 400 kilometers from New York to Boston, and it'll be an entirely other world. That's the distance Absolutely. of Milan to Rome. And By the way, thank you for this information, because I, I, first of all, I never knew that the invitation from Tanglewood the first invitation was yeah. to the New York Phil, and I also never thought of it that way that, um, the colonial founding and culture has shaped the growth of the culture of the city. Just to name the third of the big three of those times in the North, at least, is Philadelphia, which had a more German founding. It was not founded by the Germans, but it had a it has historically a German and Swedish underpinning that um, when they're called the Pennsylvania Dutch, they're not Dutch, they're Deutsch. And these are people of Germanic origin. And these differences are very notable. Benjamin Franklin was born in Boston, but somehow found Philadelphia more congenial to himself than Boston ever was to him. He found Boston restrictive. He found New York irritating. Philadelphia to him was a more open city, a place where he could develop and grow and invent and create things. And those are just three American cities in, in colonial times. There was no Washington, but there was Baltimore was a major city. Charleston in the South was a major city. And so all of these places formed the culture of the United States. New Orleans, before the United States became a nation, was an important city. And again, the first three cities of opera in the United States were New Orleans, Charleston, and New York. And I say them in that order because no one will ever fully agree whether New Orleans or Charleston were first. The first opera in French was done in New Orleans around 1765. Right around the same time, the first opera in English was done in Charleston. A year or two later, New York had opera and we already started seeing opera in different languages here. And we were the first city of Italian opera in the United States because Lorenzo da Ponte, Mozart's librettist, after the death of Mozart in 1791, moved to what was New York City, Manhattan. And 
brought along his books and his wife was her idea to bring his books. And they formed the core of the Italian collection of what was then called King's College and became Columbia University. Hmm. And when I was a student at Columbia, I was not in the Italian department, but I did Italian history and culture and was allowed to be the custodian of the De Ponte collection of books, which were in the Italian department. Now they're at the Columbia Library. So the first Italian department in the Americas was at King's College, Columbia University. And De Ponte taught Italian in New York and promoted opera in New York City. And that's how New York went ahead of Charleston and New Orleans to become the opera capital of the United States, which it still is. So I say this because anywhere one can go, one can see opera, one can create opera. I know you've done a lot of opera creation in Boston and we will get to that, but where were you first exposed to opera? Back in Singapore, of course, to Bohem, which is, I think, universal all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> Most people will say the very first encounter. Um, uh, and I have to say that it was the, just the incredible melodies that absolutely um, captured me at, at, at that time. Um, however, we don't, at that time growing up, um, uh, opera wasn't um, a, a large part of my cultural life. So even though I was the first time I encountered it, then, you know, it was probably on, the only time but it stuck in my mind. And it was only after I came to the United States um, that I actually could see opera in Boston. Um, and then of course, when I married my second husband who was passionate, Charles was absolutely passionate about this. I mean, we had opera playing 24 seven in every room in, in our home. Um, and I don't know how he works with, with, with it going on because then I tend to sort of like listen to it and then I forget what I'm doing and all work ceases, you know? So what was I, his work? Well, Charles, um, actually, um, was the uh, co-founder of White Snake Projects. I know that. And he was trained as a lawyer, but being an irascible iconoclast. He was uh, in a large New York law firm for all of one year before <laughs> <laughs> they either fired him or close to, but he left. And then he became an entrepreneur because he could never work for anybody. And he had a lot of failures as all entrepreneurs do. You know, he bought the old theater on Bleak, Bleak, Bleaker Street, we sold that to try to develop it was an utter failure. Um, he did all kinds of things until he finally ended up in a, um, he founded Interqual, which is still the gold standard for medical protocols. It's mm -hmm. how medicine, uh, medicine judges, uh, whether hospitals and, and um, healthcare providers have given the appropriate care and are billing correctly. And of course he was a lawyer and hardly ever knew anything about medicine, but, but it was an incredibly successful company because he learned the secret of success, which is mastery of skills is transferable. So, uh, this is what I call mastery of excellence so that when you are good at one thing and it doesn't matter what it is, it could be bricklaying, it could be writing, it could be piano playing. But if you really have dedicated yourself to your craft and achieved excellence, you then understand how to transfer that skill set, how you got to become excellent to a totally different area. 
The reason I, that's wonderful, by the way. And the reason I asked you what he did for his work is because you said that he had opera music on all the time. If I am listening to opera music, I can't work and do anything else because that is my work. And I have to pay <laughs> entirely close attention to interpretation, to language, to is it off pitch? Is it sharp? Is it flat? Um, how the singer uses her vowels, all of those things. So I listen with my fullest attention. And therefore, if I'm writing, if I'm cooking, I cannot have opera music on. I tend to have Motown sort of, you know, Diana Ross, The Temptations, or gospel music, which I find very uplifting. I adore gospel music. To me, in the hierarchy of music, there's opera, there's gospel, and then everything else. And no, really, it's, it's, it's a great passion of mine. And so that's what I will have on. But anything that I need to understand, analyze, fully perceive such as music, I don't know, let's say I were to put on music from India. I cannot have that as background music. I really have to fully listen. I love music from India, but I cannot just have it in my environment. It has to be my full attention. And so I admire Charles for being able to have opera music on all the time and do all the work he did. And it may well be, and you tell me if you think this is so, that the music focused him and energized him in such a way that he was able to do what he did? I truly believe it did because he has it on when he's driving. He, honestly, he, it's even playing in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> That's why I had the <laughs> No, it's Dr. true. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why our, our offices are side by side and I had the contractor soundproof the wall between us mm -hmm. because I cannot work with all with the music on because I yeah. get distracted. Yeah, yeah. Um, so white snake projects i went last night and looked up the story of the white snake it's much longer than i thought it would be so i can't tell it in a few words but it was listed as one of the four great folk tales of the chinese tradition could you talk about how you reached the notion of the white snake to name your projects and what it means in the chinese context but also what it means for your projects so every Asian person growing up, whether it be in Asia or if they're culturally Asian, uh, if they retain you know, their Asian culture in the United States or anywhere in the world, will know the story of the white snake. Because it's such a beloved story and so iconic to us. And so it was a story that I grew up with as a child and as always, I can't even tell you when I knew the story because it's so much a part of my DNA. And, um, and um, I, you know, so White Snake uh, became for me everything, um, you know, memories, especially childhood memories get transformed. So my White Snake is different from yeah. A folk legend, White Snake. It's what you said at the very beginning uh, uh, of this conversation, Fred, which is that we could all be reading or watching the same thing and we all have a different perception of it, right? Um, so my uh, Charles had a big birthday and um, I wanted to give him something special. He wasn't a particularly materialistic kind of person. And at his age, you know, what do you want stuff, more stuff? So I thought, okay, I'll commission a vocal piece, maybe a song cycle for him. And I worked with this new music ensemble to do that. And I don't understand this. This is my first experience with commissioning. 
it takes forever and they can't make <laughs> up their minds. And But I, I don't didn't know this because I'm so goal oriented. You know, I'm from Singapore. We get things done. We, we have a goal and we just go for it. And I'm like, what's going on with you guys? We're going to miss his birthday uh, <laughs> at this rate. <laughs> And uh, I was so frustrated. One day I woke up at 5 a.m. and I just sat in front of my computer and I guess you would call it a treatment. Treatment Mm -hmm. for Madam White Snake just poured out of me. And when Charles woke up, I waited for him to have his cup of coffee because Charles is a Brooklyn, Brooklyn boy. And therefore, as you say in New York, Coffee is your thing. And after his first cup, maybe his second cup, I handed him the draft and he said, what is this? And I said, your birthday present. And that from there, we developed um, the libretto together. And then um, we had a, um, um, he asked me to cold call Opera Boston, who then produced the show. And um, it went on to tremendous success, Madam Whitesnake. Uh, we commissioned Joe Long and it premiered the composer, a, yep. a composer, yes, Chinese American composer. And it premiered in 2010 and um, to great success. And Charles died after the premiere. Mm. Um, so he never lived to see the fact that. Madam White Snake went on to win the Pulitzer Prize in music for so long. So, um, so does that mean that you're a Pulitzer Prize winner too because you are the librettist? I don't think the Pulitzer Prize actually recognizes librettists. I better check that. You know, as I said, I went to Columbia University and the journalism school, and that's who gives out the Pulitzer Prizes. Right. I'm going to look right. that up. <laughs> no, I don't think they do. That's why it's it's the Pulitzer Prize in music. It's yeah. not the Pulitzer Prize for opera, you know? And so I, I don't think so, because when I went to the ceremony at Columbia University with, with Joe Long and a couple of other people, you know, uh, his wife and, and so on and so forth, Chen Yi is his wife, another wonderful composer. Um, they only gave it to him, and I was sort of an appendage. Wow. When I think about the fact that the Ponte inspired Mozart, Boito inspired Verdi, um, Piave inspired all kinds of composers, Camerano inspired Donizetti, we could name them all with the exception of Wagner and Berlioz and just one or two more in which they wrote their own libretti. It's Hoffman's style with, with Strauss is a very important mm-hmm. one that music as pure music is magnificent, of course, but an opera is almost always born from the text. The composer then takes the words And he or she will take the meaning in the words and the sounds of the words to then create music that tells the story in in diverse and fascinating ways. But I think I have never thought about this before, that if a Pulitzer Prize is given to an opera or a song cycle for music, it has to go to the librettist, too. Hmm. Yes, well, I think so, too, Fred. I (laughs) wouldn't. I will send our conversation to the people in Colombia because I really do think that Um, it's just there's something missing right there, especially because the Pulitzer Prize is also honor writing in journalism and creative writing and novels and theater and plays. Um, All right. I will have to find out. I will let you know. Maybe they'll send you a Pulitzer Prize (laughs) 10 years later. I know only have one little um i don't know what you call it not a trophy but you know what i mean a, a plaque a medallion and, or a plaque yeah, yeah. a plaque and yeah. it's only given to the composer even though i'm standing right there i don't they don't have a second wow back for me yeah no, that, no that's i've never in all my years when i was when i was a student at columbia my professor professor richard baker 
who, by the way, grew up in China, spoke fluent Mandarin, taught Chinese students, um, but he was originally from the U.S. Um, he was in charge of the Pulitzer Prize Committee, and I worked assisting him on that. But it never it never came up, and I never asked him. But now I will have to, since we're talking about Professor Baker, who I adored. Every day he would take his students to a Chinese restaurant near Columbia called the Moon Palace, and that was the Chinese restaurant at Columbia. And Professor Baker had his own table, and he would show up with eight or ten students, and we would continue our lessons basically over a Chinese meal every day at lunch. It was like more like a British tutorial than an American class. And um, all right, so we've gone off on that, but <laughs> yes, yeah, but that is, but I have to tell you this food and 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 talk and it's so Chinese because of course with Chinese opera, you know, people just eat and drink all the way through the opera. And that's what I've always wanted for 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 opera really. And when Charles and I conceived of Madame Whitesnake, we didn't do it in just as Madame Whitesnake. We um, conceived of something called the Ouroboros Trilogy, Ouroboros being the ancient snake that eats its own tail, which is a symbol of reincarnation because when the snake eats its tail, it's, it dies. But mm -hmm. Yet the tail provides such sustenance for its rebirth, you know. And so mm. in Ouroboros trilogy, we have three Madame White Snake spawns, two other operas, which circle around like the snake eating its tail. And then the concept is to do one in the morning and then have lunch, and then do one in the afternoon, then have dinner, and then do one mm. at night and have supper i mean of course if we could eat in the theater which they don't allow you to it would have been even better but um that's not how western theaters are set up you know well so, it was it was in the past where one would dine while eating and i know and throw your bones on the floor exactly and even make little fires or the tomatoes that the singers <laughs> but um I, I want to get to the trilogy a bit later, but let's talk about China. I've only been there once. I was there, I can tell you the month, May of 1996. I visited Beijing in northern China, so that's quite a while ago. And I know it's completely different now than it was then. But I did go to Peking, what was called Peking Opera, Chinese Opera, and I loved it. It went on for hours. The audience was very interactive. They drank their tea. What I discovered in China that time that I absolutely adored is the degree to which people laugh. And not just at the opera, but in life. They, they really had rollicking senses of humor in China, at least in the places I went to. It's not that I had a notion that they wouldn't, but I don't think I've ever been in another place apart from New York City and maybe London where people laugh so much. And that was a great surprise and a great pleasure to me. I adored Chinese opera. And did you grow up with that at all, with Chinese oh, opera? Oh, yes, yes. In, uh, but it was, and it's very strange because um, it was kind of a, um, a, a, a sort of readapted form of Chinese opera because there are many different kinds, you know, there's Kun Chu, Chi opera, there's Shanghai opera, there is um, Sichuan opera, there's the Beijing opera. And in Singapore, because we have so many different um, um, uh, kinds of Chinese people from all different provinces, all speaking different dialects, and what happens is it all gets amalgamated into what we call Wayang, which is Chinese opera, which is just imagine it. So growing up, so they would take, you know, we had these giant, um, we call them circuses, but, but they are what we call it in America, we call them roundabouts, mm -hmm. you know, 
square cars come and then you give way and then you go around. Roundabout uh, is more British. We sometimes say clover leaf. In other words, where roads intersect and then depart from one another again. But there is a big um, round space in the middle. Yes. Oh, I see what you're right? saying. Yeah. Yes. And, they feed in uh, and then they go out. Yeah. Yes. So in that big round space, believe it or not, with all these cars and lorries and trucks going round and round and round, <laughs> that's where we set up. They set up uh, the theater, the Chinese opera theater, mm -hmm. and uh, the food vendors, like food, they're not food truck, they're all hand. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll set up and with stools and everything, and we would just sit there. And it's day and night. I mean, it's like performing all day and all night and you're eating and you're drinking and the cars are going around and around and around. And that's how I grew up with Chinese opera. Or that sounds wonderful. And so were the stories of Chinese opera, did they become part of your um, texture is the word I'm going to use as a person, as a creative person? Uh, when Absolutely. I was a child, I read a lot of Russian folk tales, but also Native American tales. And they very much informed my view of the world. The Russian more for the fantasy and for the making wishes, whereas the Native American for about the protection of the earth and the respect for elders and the sense of continuity of time. I was profoundly influenced by those tales, less so by the famous German and Danish tales that most people read. But absolutely, you yeah. can't help it because you see it every weekend, you know, and it becomes it becomes so much a part of who you are. These fables, these stories, and all of them have a moral lesson mm -hmm. because they're all based on ancient folk tales and quest sagas and and all of that. And the interesting thing about uh, the story of the white snake is, you know, it the sort of moral of it. Of tell, the story. tell the story a bit. To, I, when I read it last night, it was very long and complicated with many iterations of things happening and people vomiting into the sea and then other things coming out of the sea and different figures and then a green snake and a white snake. And it was very detailed. Yeah. But try to synthesize it if you could. It very simply, it's a transformation myth, okay? And we all know about this. And, you know, you've got examples in, I think, The Little Mermaid, in um, uh, where there is this snake spirit who yearns to be human to experience love, just like The Little Mermaid. And after importuning the gods for years and years and years and years, they ground her wisp. And she becomes, she's able to assume a human form. She meets the love of her life, who is a herbalist. They get married, but the union between a snake and a human being is taboo. And mm -hmm. authoritarian religious society, of course, cannot condone it. When you think about our miscegenation laws here in the United States, where even <laughs> marrying the same species, you know, we're all human beings, but one human being is white and one human being is not white is illegal. Can you imagine if we had legal, you know, if you had like bestiality, bestiality going on, you mm -hmm. know, so. If but one of us really had fins and scales. <laughs> <laughs> It could become but a pocketbook. <laughs> but of course, that, that's just a symbol. That's just a symbol for <laughs> about for the religious authorities uh, and societal um, authorities not tolerating differences, right? Mm -hmm. In the found, so this abbot who represents society comes in. He. Um, reveals the true identity of the snake and um, spirits of her husband and the snake uh, is then turned in turns back into this vengeful snake who has lost her humanity because the love that made her human 
has been taken away. And so she brings up the waters to drown the monk and that causes severe flooding in China and kills millions of innocent people. You know, and that was a folk tale that was told in China to explain the yearly, the annual flooding of the Yellow River. And of course, then it evolved. It evolved from the explanation of a natural annual disaster into this fable with the moral of the story being, it was really directed to the men. Don't hook up with strange, beautiful women because you never know, they can be, you know, these demon spirits. And then over time, uh, it evolved through the ages. And it's a very interesting question um, how it survived, because of course, this is a very powerful woman, the white snake, right? And to defang her, they turned her into a helpless victim who is just this beautiful, wronged woman who is destroyed by this abbot. You know, and so I, my version is, of course, the way I remember her is as an incredibly powerful woman who has all the strengths of uh, all the attributes of power um, and goodness and love and virtue, but also the other side of the coin, which we all have, which is the evil part of us, you know, the vengeful, spiteful, the, the part that won't turn the other cheek, right? Yeah, and so that became my, my heroine and that actually became the inspiration for White Snake Projects, which is a, a some, the idea of someone who reaches for the unreachable, you know, because that's what the white snake wanted, to become human, right? Never thinking that one day she could, falling and achieving her dream, but understanding the huge risks to her personally of failure. So what you've described in some ways is a combination of Wagner's Brunhilde, taking us back to Die Valkyra, and Dvorak's Rusalka, especially the And story why do you Rusalka. think I chose that I, opera now, that you now started I've, off Now with. I've learned. Now I've figured it out. <laughs> That's right. That's why I find the Brunhilde figure so inspirational. And of course, I find the choice that Brunhilde made for love, right? When she chose love, which I find that scene where Brunhilde goes to, uh, appears to... Um, uh, Zygmunt and says, you know, uh, come with me to Valhalla. And then he asks the questions, oh, who's going to be there? And, he, and she says, Wotan. And he says, and are this going to be the heroes? And she says, yes. And he says, anybody else? She says, all these beautiful women. And then he says, will that one woman, Siglinda, yeah. be there? And she says, no. And he says, so I'm not going. And he says, I, Bruce Mir Valhalla, give my regards to Valhalla. I'm not going. I love that line. Bruce Mir me Valhalla. Me too. And so, you know, er, the kills as I say it. <laughs> I know. I yeah. know. And then Brunhilde makes that choice, which the white snake makes, of course, which is I choose love, even the risks of doing that. You yeah. know, and yeah, now you know why I chose it. Well, I now I do, and so do our listeners. I want to go a little further because while I have massive admiration for Chinese and other cultures of Asia, I'm a complete amateur in my knowledge of them. I can claim knowledge in other things, but certainly not that. But I'm always fascinated and impressed. And when, because China to me represents an entirely other world in our same world, and maybe one with more history, more wisdom, 
more patience. I don't know. And I, I don't ask you to define the nation that your family came from, but um, because it's so complex, but I love the complexity of it. But I have found that what people used to call the Chinese horoscope, and I believe it's more for much of Asia, with 12 different animals and symbols and so on, is taken very seriously there. And a word I've heard a lot in China, but also from Chinese people, is auspicious, which is a very interesting word because auspicious is not good, although it kind of can be good. Auspicious might be promising. Auspicious might mean in your best interest, but the way, the indirection, the subtlety of many, many perceptions that people in parts of the West speak very directly about is fascinating to me in my interaction with people from Asia. And in your experience, is the astrology and which to me is part of the myth and the storytelling, is it taken very seriously or is it really just something practiced on as a folkloric thing? I think, um, again, it's part of our DNA. And I think some people take it very seriously and go to fortune tellers, you know, and they read their horoscopes just the way people here have their own Western astrological signs. And, but for the rest of us, it's very important. Like, for instance, I'll tell you this. Um, uh, when we were interviewing composers for um, Madame Whitesnake, um, Zhou Long and Chen Yi, both husband and wife composers, came to dinner with Charles and me. And so the four of us were sitting around, we're talking about who was going to compose Madame Whitesnake, and whether it was going to be jointly between Zhou Long and Chen Yi. And Chen Yi, of course, could, couldn't do it. Uh, by herself because at that time she was extremely busy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it came out that we were all born in the year of the snake okay uh -huh. but here's the incredible <laughs> thing Chani was born in the start of the year of the snake so she's the head of the snake Jo Long was born in the middle and he was the body of the snake and I was born at the end of the year of the snake. So I'm the tail. And together we form the whole snake. And everybody said, that's an auspicious sign. This project is meant to be. And you know what? It was. So without dealing with ages, because I don't care about that too much, but were you all born in the same year or 12 years apart because... The years return every 12 years where it's snake. We were born in the same year. Rabbit or dog in, or whatever. In the same year, just in mm -hmm. different parts. Parts of the same year. That's fascinating. So yes. this prompts me. You you are teasing all kinds of things out of me that I haven't <laughs> thought about in many, many years. Do you know the story of the rabbit and the snake? The rabbit and the snake. Yes. Um, I, I don't think so. Then allow me to tell it to you. I hope I can still remember it because it's been maybe 25 years since I've told it. So a rabbit is bounding through the tall grass and bangs into something and falls backwards. And the other thing falls backwards. And you hear the noise in the grass as they both try to stand up again. And the rabbit says, oh, excuse me, I apologize I banged into you and for please forgive me. And the other thing sort of straightens up and he says, oh, excuse me, I apologize. I banged into you, I did not see you. You see, I'm blind. And then the rabbit says, how interesting, I'm blind too. And they say, well, goodbye, sir, goodbye, sir. And then the rabbit says, Sir, I'm sorry to disturb you, but you're so kind. As I said, I'm blind. I don't know what I am. Maybe you can help me. And the snake says, oh, that would be my honor. And he wraps himself around the rabbit and he comes off and he says, 
well, you're very soft and you have a cotton tail and floppy ears. I believe that you are a rabbit. And the rabbit says, oh, thank you. How very kind. What can I do for you? And the snake says, well, you see, I'm blind and I don't know what I am. Maybe you can help me. And the rabbit moves all along the snake's body up and down and he comes off and the rabbit says, well, you're very slimy and you have no ears. You're a music critic. <laughs> I, love that. I have not thought of that in 25 years. <laughs> oh, 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 God. I have to write this down and send it to some of the critics that I, I, I have issues with. <laughs> But remember, they're very polite to one another. <laughs> That's central to the story is that they're very correct and very polite. Excuse me, sir, my apologies. It's my fault. <laughs> anyway, the white snake projects that you created with your husband and have continued has produced many things since that original project. And you said that that was part of a, of a trilogy. Let's start by talking about the trilogy, and then we'll get into more of your recent works, because that's where I came to know you, your work. Okay. So the trilogy is called Ouroboros, and we talked about what the Ouroboros mm -hmm. is and the concept for it. And it consists of um, Naga, which um, is composed by Scott Wheeler and um, Gilgamesh, which is composed by Paola Prestini, mm -hmm. and of course, Madame Whitesnake, which is composed by Zolo. And um, the stories of uh, uh, circle one into another. So Naga is the genesis of the white snake, where we explore the white snake before she became Madam White Snake, and how she meets um, the monk in a different life when he was um, not a monk, and how he rescued her. This is all based on parts of the legend of the White Snake. How he rescued her from from a, a trap, and she she never forgot him never forgot his face, never forgot his hands, lifting her out of the, the trap. And so then it, he became imprinted in her. And um, so it follows that journey. And then from there, we get to Madame Whitesnake, where this is where she yearns to be human, to experience that kind of love that she has kind of got an inkling about. Um, and then Gilgamesh comes after that, and that's when uh, um, the white snake is pregnant. Um, when we leave Madame White Snake, she's pregnant at the time of the war with the abbot. And in Gilgamesh, she gives birth to her son, who doesn't know his origins. Right? He doesn't mm -hmm. know he's the product of a uh, human, a mortal and a snake demon. And uh, when it's revealed to him, of course you can imagine the shock, uh, when it's revealed to him, then the question is, how is he going to, to use that power? You know, is he going to use the power the way his mother did, where it became destructive? Or is he going to renounce it and truly follow uh, the way? And so it, it, it deals with that struggle. And um, yeah, so you, each opera is standalone. You can do one without the others, but of course it's always, it had always been Charles and my dream to do them in that, in that circle when we did. Mm -hmm. I did it after, of course he watched it from wherever he is. Yes. And um, yeah. And then you continued on your own as a producer, as a creator, as sometimes a librettist, to foster other new opera. So White Snake's projects 
white snake projects is really about new contemporary work about work that I would imagine, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, speaks to issues in our lives, in our world, perhaps directly, perhaps indirectly. Um, and more recently, and this is where I first encountered your work, with the arrival of COVID, of the pandemic in, let's say the beginning, the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020 in different parts of the world, you were one of the very first people to migrate to the virtual, to the online world, and create opera that was fabulous, actually, <laughs> that I saw, that stunned me, because you should know if you don't, that Fred Plotkin on Fridays is also a product of the pandemic. I began it on April 24th, 2020 with Thomas Hampson and then Christine Gerke at a time when people were locked down and locked in and not performing and theaters were mostly shut. And each Friday at 2 p.m. in New York, I would have a guest and they could be wherever they were in the world. So we went from, you know, the kind of teaching that I do in New York City in New York University and elsewhere in front of live audiences to having people from everywhere who would join me and it would become sort of a snapshot of that moment in the early parts of the pandemic, but not talking about the pandemic. The pandemic hovered above all of us in the world and still does, but it has evolved and people produce art differently since then. And I did not want to talk to them about not producing art. I wanted to talk to them about producing art, about their artistic ideas, about what they were doing, about giving them, frankly, company and giving me company because I was lost away too, and making this a forum for creativity and inspiration, very specifically inspiration. So my rule is that I've invited people on this show who have inspired me. And as I said at the beginning of our conversation today, we've never met and we've never conversed before, but your work and very specifically the work you did when I was starting this show caught my eye because it was the other major initiative that I saw at the very beginning of the pandemic. So having said that, talk about what you did that was about Alice, which is quite something. Yes, so, um, well, you know, it was um, it was a matter of survival for us, Fred, because we are so young and so small. So when other companies were able to communicate with their audience by taking out their live, you know, drawing from their libraries or archival videos, and you know, archivals really are not meant to be streamed like that because they they don't have the right production values and whatnot. But people were just desperate to connect, right? Um, to art and especially performance art. And um, we didn't have, you know, a library uh, or, or that we could, uh, could, could draw on. So it was either we produce new shows or we die. Mm -hmm. And of course, death was not an option. No. <laughs> <for me. laughs> We had only just begun, right? That's, that's La Gioconda, <laughs> not you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, um, uh, so, so, uh, so anyway, I, I didn't want to give up on the idea of live performance because for me, music making, it's one thing to listen to a recording. I think it's wonderful. You can have amazing production values if you have a pre-produced video or like the companies that can afford it actually bring in a film crew and they have like, they go, become like a film producer, you know? So they, they, they have a shooting on set and then it's incredible production values. But that's something lost because no matter how flawed live performance is, because of course you never get to say, okay, let's edit this mistake out of it and let's put, you know, 
uh, she missed the top note. Let's like mm-hmm. edit, you know, edit a different take onto that show, right? No, 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 no. You get it, Watson, all. But what you get is that adrenaline flow, the rush, the for both the audience and the performers. You know, you get that risk of failure, that in the moment choice of artistic decision making so no live performance is the same today as it was yesterday or the day before that because the performers are all making choices in the moment and um if they make a mistake they have to recover from it you know draw on their years of training um to to keep going and so make it seamless so the audience doesn't know we know but hopefully the audience doesn't so That's what I wanted. And being a Neanderthal, technically, I didn't really even know that there was this thing called latency or lag, which is why you can't have live music performance that's socially distant. You know, everybody has to be in the same room so that all that. You have to define that further. Yes. So that the sound, there were no glitches and no lags and no delays. And you had to hope that your internet signal was strong enough that it wouldn't suddenly go out or ah, as happens occasionally. Yeah. I, I just want to say the full title and then ask you to describe it. Alice in the pandemic. Yes. What is Alice? I know it is, but I want you to describe what Alice in the pandemic is and how, so Alice, how you created it and how you executed it. So Alice in the pandemic was our first attempt to conquer latency or lag. And it was um, produced and written, believe it or not, the, I believe in March, on March 20th, the president declared that we were now in a pandemic. And we produced it in October, which meant the story Mm -hmm. concept, the book and lyrics, so to speak, the story concept, the, 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 the libretto, the commissioning and composition and the orchestration and the production had to happen in six months, Mm -hmm. which was, it must be a world record. Plus we had to invent new technology to make life socially distanced. uh, So we started off with a manual process where our audio engineer, John Robertson would physically manipulate the audio feeds coming in so and sync them together so that we don't get you know you coming in a second before I come in Uh, because of course in opera everything the chorus has to be like this right Mm -hmm. not like that and then I had already worked I had a produced permadeath in 2018 it was the world's first video game opera and we I had, uh, partnered with uh, area colleges to work in the game platform Unreal Engine mm-hmm. Call of Duty etc cetera, etc cetera, these huge names right uh, epic games uh, you know all of that and I'm just going to repeat the title in case people missed it permadeath Perma death, short yes. for permanent death, which okay. is not a te- to- tautology in video games because when you think about it, you shoot, you know, in the first person shooter games, you shoot somebody down, but then they rise up again and start shooting back at you, right? They never die permanently. Mm-hmm. And um, so I had started working in Unreal Engine and I thought to myself, wow, I could put Unreal Engine for the video feeds in together with this audio technology we were developing and we can make live socially distant opera virtually. In other words, create a whole new genre of performance making, which is not in theater, and it's not film. It's something just for the small screen, you know. And then you have to write work that would fit in the small screen. Because you cannot take a work like Aida and try to make it for the small screen. My God, that is just simply not going to work. Um, so, um, yeah, so Alice in the Pandemic was 
uh, we, we made environments in the engine, Unreal Engine, which is 3D immersive. We took video, live video feeds, we processed it through the engine so that these singers who were in Florida, New York, Mississippi, whatever, they all appeared to be in the same set. They were all live, you know, and they were all singing live and being processed through 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 the new technology and that was Alice in the pandemic which was about a nurse falling down the rabbit hole which is the strange pandemic world we were entering where signature song time is elastic right you lose all moorings of your time because now your routine is shot to hell and um yeah, so that was the first one. And then we iterated on that technology in the second of, this is called the Pandemic Trilogy. You mm-hmm. see a theme here? I love yes. trilogies. <laughs> <laughs> the second the second, second piece in the Pandemic Trilogy is called Death by Life. And it was our response to the murder of George Floyd. And mm-hmm. we took, we acquired rights to the work by writers, uh, incarcerated writers and a family shaped it into a libretto and we had five black composers set it and we premiered it on the anniversary, the first anniversary of his death. I, I know that most people in the world probably know the name George Floyd, but I think it's important that I say who he was. Yes. He was an African American man who was he was not from Minneapolis, but he was in Minneapolis. He was from Texas originally. Um, very large man who was taken by a police officer with three others who watched and pinned to the ground. And the police officer dug his knee into George Floyd's neck, suffocating him and killing him over nine minutes. A young 17 year old woman who I think deserves a Pulitzer Prize, had the composure to stand there and film all of this so that it would be documented for history because it could never, it could never be said that George Floyd attacked the police officer, did anything of the sort. But what we witnessed in real gruesome nine minutes plus was the murder of a man by a police officer. And it sparked... I think justifiably all kinds of movements and discussions and obviously and unfortunately George Floyd is not the exception people but especially people of color and people of African descent have been murdered attacked shot by police where they shoot first and ask questions later and so it justifiably has raised a reckoning and questioning that is important and that Art has its place in doing, and George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, and all the other names we could name have inspired this art, or through their terrible tragedies have inspired this art. And I think it's important that art become, journalism is the first draft of history, but art is then the longer term examination of events and what it means in our society, which takes us back to the beginning of our conversation about if the law is not right, do we just object to the law and behave as we see it, or do we try to change the law, or do we work through the legal system? We don't have to address that again, but I want people to understand that art, and specifically opera in this case, is about who we are and what we do. So I'm handing back to you now, Death by Life. Yes. So the way we did that that by life was really interesting because it was such a seminal event during the pandemic where it was really the rebirth of the Black Lives Matter movement, which had lost momentum. Mm -hmm. And George Floyd became the symbol of everything that was wrong with policing and um, and the fact that we were ha- that the, and the racist underpinnings of some of our most important uh, institutions, and uh, we convened a brain trust of a wide variety of people, activists, people who work in um, in in social work, 
opera makers, singers, artists, and we said, we need to respond because just putting up the banner, Black Lives Matter, just doesn't cut it for me, you know. We need a response in opera for a lot of reasons, because it's important for White Snake and our mission, but also because I think we need to also show the world that opera cares in a fundamental and deep way, and that the idea that opera is always five or 10 years behind the times is just wrong, mm -hmm. that we can respond timely. And so people came up with the idea of long-term and mass incarceration, because that's one of the endpoints of racialized policing. And that's how we came up with the idea of acquiring the rights to these works and making that the basis of the libretto and commissioning you know, the, the, a team of five Black um, composers to, to do the music. So that was our, our second um, opera in the trilogy using, now it was an actual audio plugin called Tutti Remote and of course Unreal Engine. And then the third uh, opera in the trilogy is called A Survivor's Odyssey. And that responds to the surge in intimate partner violence during lockdown, you know, when all the shelters were closed, when women were locked down with their abusers. I say women, but it's really both women and men, but the majority is women. Mostly women. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, with their abusers and they had no place to go. And in some states, in some countries, this domestic abuse or intimate partner violence increased by 500, 600, 700% we're talking. Uh, and it received very little play in the press because, you know, it's a woman's, people say it's a woman's issue. Of course it's not, it's everybody's issue. It's a yeah. family issue, right? But it's perceived as a woman's issue and therefore there's really a lot less media attention given to it. And I thought, you know what, we need to say something about this. And so what I did was we convened the same, uh, another brain trust, we brainstormed it and we came up with the idea of looking at Homer's Odyssey and taking the two principal women, Penelope, who is the wife of Odysseus, and Circe, the witch, and looking at their story through their eyes, because of course, you know, it's the idea of history being written by the people who won, right? So now we're looking at it through the woman's eyes and not through the, the male gaze. And, um, and telling their story through their eyes and then examining that and seeing the way they are treated by men. And uh, for instance, we, we show Penelope in that very famous scene you know, of unraveling where she, to fob off her suitors, she weaves a shroud during the day in front of them. And at night, she unravels the whole thing. She does that for years and years and years and years. And we say to her, Penelope, why are you doing this? There's something wrong. This is not normal behavior. You know, why are you so afraid of getting remarried? Are you afraid of what your husband could do to you? And is it normal to be unraveling work that you've done? So it's some form of PTSD that, that she's exhibiting, which of course nobody who reads Homer and views her as the wife, you know, the paragon of wifely virtue ever even talks about. The same with Cersei, you know, the story goes, she turns all these men who Odysseus men into pigs and then he comes he's warned ahead of time so he drugs her and then you know they have sex and all of that it's all done sort of really nicely but in fact you think about it he drugs her and then has sex that's the first world's first date rape drug mm -hmm. right that's the way we we, we try to examine a well-known story from just a different perspective. And so you get to see different things. And of course, at the same time, we've improved on the technology. We've got so much better uh, 
uh, doing it. Yeah. So because you do trilogies and you're, you've completed a trilogy, are you thinking about the next trilogy? <laughs> well, I have, I've got, yeah, the short answer is yes. Yes, we are. We are okay. thinking of uh, a, a, another trilogy, but, you know, we have our hands full now because, of course, we got an amazing boost by getting this Mellon grant just and the um, Mellon Foundation. Congratulations. That's great. Thank news. you. Thank and I say you. the now, number is $750,000, which is a huge vote of confidence in the creation of new opera. Yes, it is. And yeah. especially for a company of our size, because of course, our budget is tiny. So this has enabled us to really expand into a full season instead of doing, you know, just one production a year and a couple of concerts. We now have four full productions a year because we now have the ability to hire more resources instead of it just being literally me and one admin person and then outsourcing everything. But we still have to oversee, um, you know, marketing, fundraising, production, the, all the departments of an opera company. So as the pandemic progresses, because to me it's not over at all, but arts companies are returning to live performances with people masking, at least in parts of the United States, not London, where people are going unmasked. But um, you have pioneered or, or helped pioneer a new technology and a new way of presenting opera that means it's not just presented in a theater in Boston, but available to people everywhere. From this point forward, would your inclination be to continue to make opera in that format, in digital opera, or return to live performances, or perhaps create live performances that then can be preserved, documented, in digital form for viewing beyond the Boston area? The answer to that question is yes, yes, and yes. Okay. So we have a hybrid season where we are opening in the fall with Cosmic Cowboy by Elena Ruhr. And uh, that was postponed from 2020, you know, mm -hmm. now it's two years later. And we are going to be capturing that um, um, to to uh, put stream on demand. And uh, then in December, same thing. We're going to be actually be in WGBH's studio. It's a WGBH TV WGBH is the public broadcasting station in Boston. Correct. Yes. So we're actually going to be performing in that TV studio. We have a live audience, uh, but we will also have the benefit of that TV and audio and and. Uh, camera crews so that we can live stream it out of the studio. Um, and so that will be captured digitally that way. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, March, when weather is not good and who knows where the pandemic is going to be at that time, we're going to do a uh, digital, fully live, socially distant virtual opera. It's called Fractured. Uh, mosaics and that is our response to the surge in anti-Asian hate crimes mm -hmm. and again it follows the model of death by life where we have five teams of Asian American composers and writers writing you know um, collaboratively to show you how who we really are as Asian Americans because that term that is an um, is is a social and political construct because we don't think of ourselves in that way, you know. We have origin memories that go back a long way, and they're very different. And um, and so that will be uh, socially distanced online. And then, of course, in May, we're going to take advantage of the good weather. Though this May, that didn't seem to be any good news on the pandemic front because there were spikes with whatever the next variant is. 
um, and launch a series called Opera Through the Looking Glass, which will be in, in an alternative uh, venue. So it could be a distillery or a warehouse or some such thing it would be new for us. Uh, when I went to Columbia Journalism School, my, I had two major professors. One of them was Richard Baker, about whom I spoke, and he was my reporting and writing teacher and mentor in a lot of ways. And the other was a wonderful professor named Phyllis Garland. And Phyllis was, Phil, as she used, was from Pittsburgh. She was African-American. She was brilliant on arts coverage and arts reporting and so on. And wonderfully knowledgeable about music. And she and I were the perfect match in a way. And I did my master's specialization with her, my thesis and such. And I remember that early on, one of her first lessons, and we're talking about 1979, was about how language has become embedded in such a way that we don't hear what we're saying. So that, for example, she said, we don't say the Orient because the Orient means the East and refers from a Western point of view to the East. Um, she said, we can say Asian, but when half to two thirds of the world's population lives in Asia, how can you lump all of those people who extend from Japan to Turkey under the same term, so to speak? And, and she was very correct. And she, among the many things she did was alert to me how language carries weight and forms opinions, even if there's no prejudice or hatred involved, but it just is a construct. So that I, not that I said Oriental much before, but if I was quoting ancient sources, I might have, if they referred to something as Oriental, in a Mozart opera, that Orient was not China, it was probably Turkey, it was Constantinople. And so I, I wondering whether we can start in Britain, for example, when they say Asia, they often mean South Asia, they mean India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and so forth. Um, and East Asia is something else. And even among China, Japan, Korea, and then Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, all of Indonesia, all of those places. Are we ready? I think we are in the United States and not only to say that someone might be Indonesian American or Indian American or Chinese American rather than have that enormous umbrella of Asian. Because I, I, I feel that many people of Asian origin or whose family came from Asia are ignored, forgotten. Someone from Myanmar, from Burma, we don't describe them or Laos. We don't necessarily describe them as who they are. And these are all different cultures. And I think if we name their origin and their culture, we'd be more open to understanding what makes them particular. I agree with you so much, Fred. And when you think about the fact that not only do we've got, have we got this huge umbrella term Asian American, but we also add Pacific Islander to the end of it, right? So it's A-A-P-I. And then I think to myself, how do Pacific Islanders fit into this? How are they even Asian and why are they, you know, and Pacific Islanders are saying like, why are we kind of an appendage to Asian uh, Americans? What is going on here with all these social con and political constructs? It, it's almost like colonization all over mm -hmm. again, you know, where people don't care about who you really are, you know, one of the ideas, one of the problems, of course, with um, uh, colonization is that people started drawing political boundary lines, you know, so India, that Indian subcontinent then becomes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, families were separated because they happened to live on the other side of this arbitrary line that was drawn. And I think it's the same thing that's going on with this AAPI because um, where do Pacific Islanders fit into all of this? 
I, I, I agree with you because Pacific Islanders could be more closely associated with New Zealand in a way. Because the Maori people of New Zealand and the indigenous people of Australia are Pacific Islanders too, as much as people from the Philippines are Pacific Islanders or Indonesia, which they all live in the Pacific and they're on islands. Japan are Pacific <laughs> Islanders. So. <laughs> it's the whole thing is crazy. Uh, these acronyms have just become another way of arbitrarily dividing and selecting out groups of people the way, you know, being a colony and then a former colony was. I, I just find it extremely difficult. I was interviewed once about the term BIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color. So, and I thought to myself, wow, you only get to be named if you are Black or Indigenous. And then everybody else is under the POC, person of color, a, a, a part of it. That, that's really. Also, white is a color too. <laughs> All human beings are persons of color. And I, you know, people who visit my Facebook page, the first thing they see me describe myself as is egalitarian. And I <laughs> profoundly believe that that we are all equal, we are all deserving of the same human rights to get back to rights issues. We are all deserving of equal access to resources, to water, to shelter, to food, to opera, which is an essential nutrient, um, to coffee. For or the tea. soul, for the, the soul. soul, yes. But, you know, I, 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 this takes me back to our very beginning again in good old Wagner and Die Valkyra and law and identity that I identify as human. And when I find people identify themselves with whatever letters of the alphabet they choose, those are labels. And my humanity is as profound as your humanity and every other person we encounter. And therefore, by creating these things, we are actually separating ourselves from one another. And we are saying, I'm not like you because I am this and you are that. And, you know, yes, someone could be born in Germany and someone else could be born in Argentina, but they may have similar DNA. We all have human DNA that basically goes back to the same place. Absolutely. Um, That's called mitra mitochondrial yeah. DNA. Yes. Yeah. And therefore, I, I get kind of tired of people identifying with these letters and these labels and so on. The reason they do that is to assert justifiably their need for rights and equality. And, but I, ideally, I think we'd have a world in which no one would be prejudiced against someone else. Unfortunately, we have a world in which someone from a nation could invade another nation saying that they are being, um, they want to liberate that nation. Now, we know that I'm referring in part to Russia invading Ukraine in the year 2020, but we've seen this throughout human history and we, I think, will continue to see it. So this is where one world, one people we are all people and we may look different and sound different speak different languages need different food that's a richness that's a complexity that's a fascination that you can teach me about chinese literature and i can teach you about how to make pasta perhaps maybe you know how to make it already but <laughs> Well, it's very much like Chinese noodles. And, and whether the noodle originated in China or Italy, but that's for another time. But, um, but that's the fact that we can compare noodles from many countries, but starting with China and Italy, and understand things such as travel and trade routes and culture and agriculture that, you know, maybe in China, rice flour is more used in Italy, wheat flour might be more used, whatever. But it's not the one is better. 
we are all part of the same planet. There's no second planet that we can go to if this one gets despoiled. Hey, and they're thinking of colonizing Mars. Remember, Fred? Well, they can go there first. <laughs> I'm staying where I am. <laughs> I want to protect this planet. Me and, too. Me and too. nourish it with opera, nourish it with food, and nourish it with love and kindness. You know, if, I think if we actually made kindness a value and a virtue above all the others, it would solve a lot of our problems. But again, we enter into the human psyche, the human behavior, which psychologists can describe, but opera composers and librettists do it better um, because it's more subtle. Music helps us understand where the words end, the music begins. And that to me is the eternal fascination of opera. Opera is not a dead art form. Opera, all the great operas of the past are great because they were great and they still are. And new opera is sensational. And I say that in conclusion because we've had a good long conversation and I know that we could continue for another 10 hours and tell each other stories. So I have been enchanted by meeting you and speaking with you. And I look forward one day to actually meet you in person. And I encourage viewers around the world to look for white snake projects.org. That's right. Cerise Jacobs, did I leave anything out? No, I, <laughs> other than the fact I wanted to say, Fred, how much I enjoyed speaking with you, how much I enjoyed laughing together with well, you because we <laughs> did have a lot of laughing in this program. Yeah. And that is just such a tonic and just such a brilliant feeling to have um, anytime, but especially during these times. So thank you. If we you, can't thank laugh, we're all going to get sick. You know that? <laughs> Yeah. That, but that's what I meant when I said to you before that I was so taken to how in China people laugh so much because that to me was delicious and, and unexpected. And I, I had no, I didn't think that they would or wouldn't, but then to discover that as an element in the Chinese society that at least that I encountered, I know China is massive, but the people who I encountered were, had wonderful light senses of humor and spirit that I adored. I well, I adore you too, Fred. You're a scintillating well, thank you. conversationalist, and I really echo your sentiment. I hope to see you in person and we can eat and drink maybe Chinese food, maybe some other food. Chinese. <laughs> 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 because I don't know how to prepare it. I love it, but I don't know how to prepare it. I've I've decided that big societies such as China and India. If there is reincarnation, I will come back and live in those places so I can learn their cultures. This life has been devoted primarily to Italian culture and knowledge and everything that that can teach. And I, I juxtapose it with every other place in the world that I go and I study. But the, I think the Italians and the Chinese are the two societies, maybe the Mexicans historically, that have brought so much more to the world in terms of who we are as, as a planet than anyone else. Is there a little dog there? I have three rescue dogs that are absolutely untrainable despite my best efforts of taking them to dog school. They come out, you know, with a little dunce head for failing. <laughs> maybe I'm maybe I'm just a bad dog mother. You I shouldn't have know. named them Ping, Pang, and Pong. <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> That's why they're they are, <laughs> Oh, my God! They are actually a different alphabet, not the Ps. They are the Ms, okay? They are Mencius, Micro Jackson, and Manicotti. Oh, you said me Manicotti, and I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> Cerise, so thank you so much. You. Best wishes. And I want everyone to visit whitesnakeprojects.org to learn more about your work. Thank Take care. You, Fred. Thank you. Thank you.